Um, okay, well, thank you very much for, uh, for coming today. Uh, good morning. My name is Sam Drake. I'm uh, an architect in the, uh, on the development team for the Oracle Times 10 in-memory database. And I'm going to talk to you today and just give you a, a, an overview of our product and what its capabilities and performance and, and all of that good stuff. There's plenty to, plenty to cover. We probably won't get through all your questions here in, uh, in 45 minutes. But uh, hopefully we'll get we'll get things introduced, and I'll be out in the hall and uh, later. Has everybody been over? Whoa, has everybody been over to the booth and got your little robot? Um, no. Well, you're not cool if you don't have a little robot. So uh, so come over to the to the demo area and uh, sign up. And uh, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure after making you listen to only a 10 or 15 minute spiel, they'll uh, they'll give you a robot and stamp your little passport. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, as I say, I work for Oracle, and um, that's, I guess I really shouldn't stand in front of the, mic, uh, of the speaker. Um, because I work for Oracle, the, everything I'm gonna tell you about today is about shipping current products. We're not gonna talk about futures at all. We're talking about things that you can go download um, and play with this afternoon if you want. But just in case I happen to say something um, about a product that we haven't quite released yet, um, for legal purposes, everything I'm about to say is a lie, so and you should not rely on it. Um, okay, now that we got all the we got that out of the way, um, before we talk about Times 10 specifically, I want to talk just for a little bit about Oracle and the Oracle products that that are in the in-memory space. Um, honestly, you know, these days every database is is plays in the in-memory space in one way or another, right? Um, a few years ago, nobody knew what an in-memory database was, and now every database has to at least say they're in memory in one way or another. Um, Oracle, it, Oracle has two primary database products that, that, that have the in-memory label attached to them, and people sometimes get a little confused about which one's which. Um, and so just to kind of set the stage for that, uh, the product I'm going to talk about today is the Oracle Times 10 in-memory database. It is a separate database product designed primarily for transaction processing. We uh, claim that it is the world's fastest OLTP database, and in fact, it, it is. Um, so if what you need to do is really, really fast transaction processing, handling you know, millions of transactions per second or something like that, times 10 is the product that you want to look at. Um, and we'll talk a lot more for the rest of the session about times 10. The other, the other thing that has the in-memory label that people sometimes get confused about is called the Oracle Database In-Memory Option. The, the in-memory option on the Oracle Database um, enhances the Oracle Database to store a copy of data in memory in columnar format to speed up analytic queries. Not for OLTP, for analytics. And so um, whether you want to use in-memory technology for transaction processing or whether you want to do it for analytics, Oracle's got products that do those things. They're very different. And so when people hear Oracle in memory, they just assume one or the other. Um, they're very different. And so I just want to set the stage that what we're going to talk about today is transaction processing. And if you want to learn more about the, the database and memory option, um, Andy is doing a great talk this afternoon um, at 2.40 that will we'll talk go into detail about the analytic um, option on the Oracle database. The other thing I'll say just in general about Oracle and memory, you know, a, a year or so ago, almost two years ago now, Forrester did an analysis of the various vendors in the space, kind of comparing their strategic, comparing their in-memory offerings in terms of their strategy and their current product set, and did a ranking. Um, naturally, as with all of these analyst things, the top right corner is where you want to be. And, and because of the robust technologies in database and memory and times 10 and the other technologies that, that Oracle has, the other products that Oracle has, uh, they put us up in the, in, at the top. And um, if anybody's here from any of the others, you know, you can do it, right? But uh, as of, as of uh, early 17, that was their analysis. And if you want to hear more about the breadth of all the Oracle products that fit into the in-memory space, um, Tirthankar Lahiri is giving a, giving a keynote speech tomorrow morning where he'll talk about times 10 and database and memory and the other technologies that Oracle has that fit into this space, give you the, the big picture. But in the absence of the big picture, I'm going to talk about times 10 today. So we're going to talk about some stuff. Um, 
First of all, I want to talk about what times 10 is. How many people have heard of times 10? Good. Um, how many people are using times 10? Not, not a surprise, um, but I, I, I dare to suggest, and we'll talk about it in a minute, I suggest that, that almost all of you are using times 10 and just don't know it. And we'll talk about some of those use cases in a minute. Um, times 10 was one of the very first in-memory databases. Um, the, fir the earliest successful in-memory database that's still around today. Um, started as a research project at, at HP Labs in 1994. It was spun off as a separate company in 1996. Um, and it acquired by Oracle in 2005 and still in use around the world today. Um, I personally joined Times 10 in 1996. Um, this morning, the keynote speaker was talking about how 20 years ago when he was a student in college, um, he did some paper on something and it just made me sad because 20 years ago I was here working on this product. How many of you were in, were, were in college 20 years ago? How many of you were in the job you have now 20 years ago. Good for you. I'll, I owe you a beer or something. So anyway, Time 10 has been around for a long time. It used in production applications around the world for more than 20 years um, for mission critical applications in a, in a wide variety of areas. The technology is very mature, very robust, and as you'll see um, in, a, in a few minutes, still um, undergrowing significant transformations and expanding into the modern world like 2018. Everybody puts up a logo slide talking about companies that use their products. We've got, a, you know, Times 10, as I say, has been used for more than 20 years um, by companies um, in lots of different industries. Uh, we're not going to go through all of these, but if you, if you look at it sort of and try to group it into a number of different categories, the big users of Times 10 around the world have been in telecom and in financial services. Um, there, um, if you've ever uh, had a prepaid mobile phone, right? You know, not you know the kind where you, you you put money into the phone and the phone works until the money's gone, and then you put more money into the phone, right? In most of the world, that's the way phones work, right? Prepa um, prepaid mobile billing is probably the most transaction-intensive application in the world. Um, if you think about how many text messages per second are sent in China, for example, right? That's a lot of transactions per second. Um, uh, we don't, and Times 10 doesn't do all of that work, but we do the vast majority of it, right? More than a billion people around the world use Times 10 every day, um, every time they make a phone call, every time they send a text message, right? You wonder how those transaction volumes are handled. Um, we do, we handle that. Um, and there are very few databases that are, that are fast enough and robust enough and provide the 24 by 7 high availability that are needed um, in order to do that. Times 10 has been around, as I said, for 20 years. Um, and there are um, the ways in which Times 10 has, there, well, in our current product, there are two different ways you can use Times 10, really three. Um, several of those use cases, several of those scenarios have been around for more than 20 years. And, and we call those today in our product, we call those Times 10 Classic. Those classic ways of using Times 10 aren't going to go away. They are fully supported. They're going to continue to be supported. And they still provide <coughs> profound benefit in terms of ultra-low response time, high throughput, but with the emphasis on ultra-low response time. Um, and we'll talk about Times 10 Classic. In our newest release, released a couple of months ago, we also are adding a new way to use Times 10 called Times 10 Scaleout, which takes that, 20, that, that, that mature technology um, base that we've developed over the last 20 years and moves it into the scale-out horizontal scaling world where you can have an in-memory database that spans not just the memory of one machine but of two or four or eight or 16 or 32 or whatever. Um, and we're, we'll talk about all of these. So all of these are times 10. It's the same bits um, um, but, but can be used in a number of different ways. In, in the classic ways, the emphasis, on response, the emphasis is on response time. In scale out, the emphasis is on massive throughput and very large databases in memory. So first, let's talk about, we'll start at the beginning. So first, let's talk about Times 10 Classic. Um, now, maybe this audience, since we're at an in-memory conference, maybe everybody here already knows this. But historically, whenever I say Times 10 is an in-memory database, people get an image of their, in their head about what that is. 
And usually that image isn't quite right. So um, what we always try to do is boil down you know, what times 10 is into four bullets and, uh, that everybody can kind of remember. Right? So times 10 at its core is a relational database. It's a SQL-based relational database. Rows and columns and indexes and um, you know, select and insert and update and delete and create user and JDBC and all the things you think of from any traditional relational database. That's what times 10 looks like from the outside. How do you use times 10? You use it just like you would use Oracle database or DB2 or SQL Server. It is a relational database. It happens that all the data in, in, in the database fits into RAM. And because of that assumption, um, that gives us some benefits. But from the outside, in terms of how do you use it, what APIs do you use, and what data model do you use, it's a SQL database compatible with the Oracle database, Oracle data types, Oracle APIs, Oracle stored procedure languages. It's a relational database. That's it. Um, when you talk about an in-memory database, people often get confused and think, well, data in memory, okay, that's a cache or something. You know, if I turn the power off, all that data is going to go away. Where am I going to, you know, how do, can I possibly run transactions in that data? Well, times 10, even though it's called an in-memory database, a times 10 database is completely persistent and completely recoverable and has high availability and disaster recovery capabilities. So you turn the power off, you don't lose anything. You, you the, the building, your primary data center, you know, falls down or is destroyed in a hurricane, that's okay, you've got a disaster recovery site somewhere else, you fail over to that. So in, every, in that way as well, it's persistent and recoverable, just like any relational database. But because times 10 was designed as an in-memory database, it's very, very fast. Um, we provide microsecond response time and very high throughput, and I'll show you on the next slide just how fast it can be. And as I, I guess I said earlier, it's highly available. Supports replication in, in, uh, within a data center and across data center, um, so you can run you know, your most critical business transactions in it without having to say, well, it's in memory, so maybe I'll lose stuff if I turn the power off. You don't have to do that. I said times 10 is fast. How, time, how fast can it be? Well, um, as I said, for times 10 classic, we talk about response time. And we, we, tr we talk about response times measured in microseconds, millionths of a second. Um, there's no other database I'm aware of that, that talks about microsecond response time. You know, if you can do, a re if you can do something in two, two milliseconds, two thousandths of a second, that's pretty good for most folks. Um, we, can do th we can do standard selects through standard SQL, through standard ODBC from a standard application in, in, in less than two millionths of a second. No magical proprietary APIs, no shortcuts, no tricks. You know, ODBC, SQL, Oracle compatible data types under two, under two millionths of a second. Updates take a little bit longer, but still, you know, five milliseconds or five microseconds for an update, um, faster than I think almost anybody else can do. So if you're interested, you know, if, if you're interested in the fastest response time possible, this is the database you need to be using. There's no other product that through standard APIs and standard interfaces can, can approach these numbers. Fast response time usually turns into fast throughput, and that works out pretty well as well. Um, if you're running that same times 10 benchmark on one machine, one machine, um, that turns into, in an 80-20 environment where you're doing 80% reads, 20% updates, um, uh, over 5 million transactions per second on a, on a single node. So again, not a bad number. So, you know, when, when, my, when the title of the talk and when the, the sticker on my laptop says it's the fastest OLTPD that database there is, it, it is. And not everybody needs to do transactions in, five mil in two millionths of a second, but if you do, there's really only one product you can use. As I said, Times 10 Classic supports real-time replication for high availability, um, supports synchronous or asynchronous replication uh, in an active standby pair, in, in an active standby environment. Each database has its own, each database has its own, there you go, has its own persistence. 
writes, you know, has its own transaction logs and, sto and storage on, on flash or disk uh, for persistence, but replication happens in real time. In addition, you can have read-only subscribers, so if you have applications that need huge amounts of read, you can have, you know, 20 machines all with read-only copies of that data, which will all be updated automatically. Um, in addition, these read-only subscribers can be at other sites for disaster recovery. And this is, this used every, I would say every Times 10 customer who uses um, Times 10 for any sort of mission critical application uses our replication. It's profoundly faster than, than most replication systems on the market. Um, there are all sorts of GUIs in, in, or in Oracle world, Oracle Enterprise Manager is used to provide management dashboards, all of that works with Times 10. Um, and talking about application development, um, because Times 10 is just a relational database that supports ODBC and JDBC and the Oracle OCI, low-level, C-level interface, um, and because it supports a, a subset of Oracle-compatible SQL and Oracle-compatible data types, um, you write applications for Times 10 just the same way you write applications today against your Oracle database. Now, it is, all of these interfaces are subsets. We don't support every single bit of Oracle SQL, but the SQL that we support is a subset of Oracle SQL. And so, you know, if you have an application that works today against, times, against Oracle Database, will it just magically work against times 10? Might, it, it very well might. We've had places where people change, you know, one line in a configuration file, don't even recompile their app, and it just works. Um, but it is a subset. What I, will, what I will confidently say is that the techniques and APIs and interfaces that you use to write applications that run at these speeds against times 10 are exactly the same techniques and APIs and interfaces that, you, your, that your Oracle database team knows how to use today. Um, because we support, you know, because, oh, sorry, because we, okay, go back. Because we support standard SQL and standard PL SQL and all those standard interfaces, um, you know, the number of different off-the-shelf things that work with times 10 out of the box is really big, um, including cool new stuff. This slide is, a, is accurate, but a little misleading. Um, it, says those, it says interfaces to things like Ruby and Go and Node and Python are coming soon. And, and that's true, kind of, but it's also, they're available today. You know, there are interfaces that you can download off GitHub that third parties have put together to interface uh, Go to the Oracle database, right? Using JDBC or OCI or ODBC. Um, those, interface, those, those interfaces work uh, against times 10, pretty much out of the box. Um, at some point, we'll have official Oracle blessed ones um, that, we'll, that we'll announce. We haven't done that just yet. That's where the coming soon thing, thing comes from. But you know, if you want to write Go programs or Python or that use times 10 at in-memory speeds, you can do that today. And, if, and we, can help you. we can help you get that going. Um, I'm going to talk just real briefly about, about uh, this application. Um, Ericsson is, a big, is, is probably our biggest customer. Ericsson um, uh, has a couple of systems that use times 10. The MPS system is an example of those. Um, it's in the telecom industry. Ericsson, you might know them as a phone company, but their, their primary, primary business nowadays is selling telecom equipment, right? So, yeah, so if you use AT&T, AT&T may buy a bunch of equipment from, from Ericsson for, to run their network. And um, one application that's used times 10 for a very long time is their mobile positioning system, right? That keeps track of where you are at all times and, and can, uh, can trigger events off of that, you know, if you... You drive by, if you've ever driven by a Starbucks and had your phone go, hey, you know, hey, would you like, would you like a latte now? That's never actually happened to me, but hypothetically, if, that, if they wanted to do that, this is the system that they would use to do it. It's deployed um, all over the world, basically, you know, almost every continent, uh, used by millions of people every day. Um, and this has been based on times 10 for a very long time. Um, they need, you know, naturally ultra-low response time, very high throughput, absolute 24-7 reliability, um, all the things that Times 10 has provided for a very long time. Um, 
And as I say, you know, if you, as far as billing for phone calls and text messages in China and other things like that, that's, that's what we do very routinely. You know, keeping track of uh, balances on prepaid uh, cards, prepaid shopping cards, right? Um, keep doing stock trading on Wall Street. Uh, you know, if Wall Street, the, the stock trading example is the most compelling one, right? Why does anybody care about microsecond response time? Well, if the price of Oracle changes and you want to buy it or sell it, you know, if you can react to that price change before the other guy does, you win and they don't win, right? So that's an example where response time is everything. And, and time stands been, been very successfully used in those sort of applications for 20 years. Okay, so Time Stan, Time Stan Classic, the product we've had for more than 20 years, uh, gives you the ability to respond to real-time events faster than anything else, um, give you, you know, great levels of response time, high availability and disaster recovery, um, without having to learn anything new. You, ha you use the exact same techniques for writing apps that you did before, uh, same APIs, same interfaces, um, you know, sometimes people will have a back-end data, relational database and then they'll say they want to put some caching layer in front of it. And for some reason they think that they have to have one data model for what's in their back-end database and a completely different data model for how they put things in the cache. You don't. Why would you want to have two different sets of code using two different mechanisms to deal with the same data? If your back-end database has if your backend database and your, your, your in-memory cache have the same APIs, same data models, same interfaces, you can write one application which can talk to either one without changing a single line of code, why wouldn't you want to do that? And that's what Times 10 allows you to do that nobody else does. Okay, so that's Times 10 classic used as the database of record, right? It's a persistent database. You don't need any other database anywhere around, right? You know, if you're doing prepaid mobile billing on your phone, you know, if you put 20 bucks into your, $20 into your phone and you're going to use it until it goes down, that balance is stored in times 10. Times 10 is the database of record. There's no other database around, right? We, that, we're doing that all by ourselves. Again, you know, people think of in-memory databases as caches or as adjuncts to other databases. It doesn't have to be. You don't need any other database at all. But if you want to use another database, if you have an Oracle database and you would like to use in memory, time stand in memory as a cache in front of it, we can do that too out of the box with a capability called time stand application tier data cache. It's the same code, uh, but enhanced a little bit so that we can establish a relationship between tables in an Oracle database and tables in a times 10 database and have times 10 transparently and automatically cache a subset of data from that Oracle database. So, um, and keep it all, keep everything in sync. Timestamp can be used for read-write caching, sometimes for, for applications that have a lot of ingest, right, where you're, you're, you're taking input very quickly. Um, oftentimes applications will um, use a timestamp cache as the place where they insert that data. As that data comes in from the real world, they insert it into times 10, times 10 that, and they can immediately query it um, and then times 10 as fast as Oracle database will accept it, will push that data back to Oracle. Um, in that case, um, uh, yeah. um, if the Oracle database goes down, you can still ingest the data, right? If the Oracle database gets busy, you can still ingest the data and we'll push it over to, to Oracle as fast as we can. But you can start doing complex queries on that data instantly as soon as you've inserted it. Time stand can also, Time stand cache can also be used for read-only caching, um, where your Oracle database is the database of record, and as changes are made in the Oracle database, that data will be propagated over to times 10, so you can query it. It can be used for more complicated things as well, like um, when a user first logs onto your website, your, web's, your web app may look in times 10 to get that user's customer profile. And if that customer profile isn't in times 10, we'll automatically go back to the Oracle database, fetch it from there, insert it into times 10, and then every time that user clicks on your website for the rest of their session, they'll access that copy in times 10. And if they ever go to lunch or log off, um, if you don't use that copy for after a while, we'll just, we'll just get rid of it in times 10. And if they log on again after lunch, then we'll pull down another copy, right? So you can take all that workload off of your, off of your backend database 
again, potentially without, re without writing an, a single line of code. Um, this will give you a flavor for how you do some of that stuff. You create these objects we call cache groups, and a cache group basically defines the relationship between a table n times 10 and a table in Oracle. Um, you can specify where clauses. You, can, you, you don't have to load an entire table. You don't have to load all the, all the rows or all the columns. You can specify the subset of data that you'd like to have available. Um, and it can be very dynamic as well. And these are real tables. Right? You can do very complex joins. If you need to do a 20 table join against data in times 10, go ahead, works fine. Uh, I think I said all of that. Um, and there are a bunch of examples of applications that use times 10 in this caching mode. This one is uh, from Ping'an Bank in China, a very large bank. Um, China's a big place and there are a lot of people and uh, they need to have a lot of phone agents, you know, answering questions on the phone. And um, it, they had a huge portability, they had a huge scalability problem um, because they had so many agents who were trying to access this database all at once, they just couldn't, it, the database, backend database couldn't handle it. Um, and these agents were distributed geographically all through the country. So it didn't make sense to make round trips all the way back to that central database location from some far-flung province every time somebody, somebody placed a phone call to their call center. So they put times 10 databases as configured as clusters in each of these geographies, hooked them up to that backend Oracle database, and now each geographical center runs independently, right? So, you know, if the link to the backend database, go, Oracle database goes down, that's okay. They can still do work. They can still answer phone calls. Um, they get much faster response time because, again, those, those islands are local or, or, or distributed around where the data needs to be, but it all synchronizes back to the Oracle database just like you'd want it to. So times 10 cache, again, right, time, times 10 classic lets you use times 10 as the database of record. Times 10 cache lets you use times 10 as a cache in front of an Oracle database. Um, and it, so that, together, these are the technologies we've been shipping and people have been using around the world for more than 20 years. So now let's talk about what's new. Um, and um, in our times 10 18.1 release that we just shipped a couple of months ago, uh, we're, we've worked for a long time to put out a new feature in times 10 called times 10 scale out, which takes, builds on everything we've done for the last 20 years and moves it into, into you know, a, a mo more modern world. Um, times 10 scale out is, as you might imagine from the name, lets you take a single times 10 database and distribute it across many, many machines. Before in times 10 classic and today in times 10 classic, the size of a data, an in-memory database is, is um, limited by the amount of RAM you can put in a single machine. An in-memory database lives in memory, lives in RAM. Um, with time sense scale out, we can, we can, for the first time, take uh, the computing resources of a large cluster of machines, up to 64 in the first release, um, and lash them all together and have a single a single in-memory database that spans all of those machines, that provides high availability, um, can, give, can support very large transaction volumes uh, in a much larger in-memory database um, um, than we could before. Um, go ahead. Uh, I was a little confused by your previous slide and this one. Okay. It's a, good, it's a good question, and, and let, me, let, me, let me repeat it since I've got the microphone to make sure everybody heard it. Um, the question is, since times 10 is an in-memory database, if you're using time, does, an in does a times 10 database have to fit in RAM? And if you're using times 10 as a cache, does that have to fit in RAM? And the answer is, the answer is yes to both of those. And, and, but, um, so the times 10 in-memory database Fits into, has to fit into memory. All the algorithms are, are based on, on the fact that the database fits into RAM, right? Um, as far, uh, 
so, and I've got another talk I've done at some of the in-memory meetups that goes into more technical detail as to why making that assumption lets us provide this order of magnitude performance benefit. Um, if you're using, so if you're using times 10 as a, the database of record, then that database has to fit into memory. If you're using times 10 as a cache in front of an Oracle database, the data that you're caching has to fit into memory, right? You can have hundreds of terabytes of data in your back-end Oracle database, but take that example where when a user logs onto the, your website, right, you take their customer profile and pull it forward, then only the profiles of all the users who have recently logged onto your website would have to fit into memory, right? So, but times 10, times 10 is not a memory-centric database. It's not a memory, um, you know, it's not a memory, uh, it's not a hybrid database. It is a pure in-memory database. It, it was designed from scratch. Every line of code was written assuming that all the data in the times 10 database fits into physical RAM. And that's why it's so fast. Good, good question. Okay, so times 10 scale out takes that same capability and extends it into um, a scaled out world. Um, with multiple copies of data kept for high availability, global secondary indexes, um, very complex SQL just like times 10 scale out. Basically everything that you, everything that works in times 10 on a single machine or in a replicated cluster of machines now works in a, in a, in a very large scaled out environment. Trade-offs are a little different and we'll talk about those, but, but it, it, everything works exactly the same. Um, the main, thing about time, the main thing about times 10 scale out I want to emphasize is that it is a single database, right? Um, people, of, people often think about systems like this. There are a lot of systems like this on the market today. Most of you are probably using one. Um, a lot of them are, are, are what they call sharded databases, right? Where you have, you know, a, a whole bunch of shards of the database. You chop the database into smaller subsets and you put a chunk of each on, on each of those different machines. We don't call this sharding. Um, sharding is bad. Um, shards, because a sharded database looks like a whole bunch of different databases. And maybe some operations can span them, but some, but a lot usually can't, right? In a lot of sharded systems, suppose my data is on one machine and your data is on another machine, and we want to transfer money from me to you, right? Um, a lot of sharded systems can't do that transactionally, right? It's the simplest possible thing in a database. I want to subtract money from my balance, I want to add it to yours, and I want to atomically commit that. So the money is either in mine or in yours, but doesn't get lost and doesn't get duplicated. A lot of sharded products can't do that most basic thing. Um, so sharding is not good. And, and Oracle sells sharding products, and if they, provide, if they help you, that's great. But nobody wants a sharded system. You want one database. Time since scale-out gives you one database. Um, you can update. You can transfer money from me to you. You can update every row in the database. You can do, and do a commit. It's, com it's atomically committed. Um, everything works exactly the way it should work. It is one database that just happens to live on a whole bunch of machines. Um, you can, it's uh, elastically scalable. You can add and remove machines from that database. Um, when uh, Golden Week is approaching and you need to add more capacity to your database, just add a bunch more machines. Or when Christmas is coming, add a bunch more machines. Um, after the holiday is over and you don't need the capacity, remove some of them and move on and, and use them for something else. That's fine. Um, because we maintain multiple copies of all your data, you get built-in high availability without having to do anything. Um, and it, again, it uses the same APIs and interfaces that time scale scaleout does, which are, which are a very large subset of the APIs and interfaces that the Oracle database has. So again, you, 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 if you have Oracle database, the folks in your, app, in your environment who write apps for that database already know how to write apps for this. Let, let's, let's, let's do questions at the end. Um, I said earlier that um, uh, we don't call this a, sca a sharded system, um, and we do that for very good reason. Sharding is not something anybody wants. It's something people might be willing to accept, but it's not something anyth anybody wants. Um, so we call them elements. And your database is built up of a set of elements. Um, there's one element per host, um, and the ele each element has its own local persistence. 
um, its own checkpoint files and log files to make the data in that element persistent. Um, and they're kind of like shards, but, but that's not a good word, so let's not call them shards. If you look inside of one of those elements in a logical manner, each, log, each element contains um, the entire schema of the database, so every table lives in every element of the database, um, and some of the rows from each table will be present in every element. Now, which of those rows are present in there? That depends on you. And in, in the first release, we provide three different distribution mechanisms um, uh, that you pick on a table-by-table -table basis, right? Would you like for us to hash distribute your customer table across different elements in the database? Um, then you can specify, you can tell us to do that, distribute by hash, and we will you know, put some of your customers in each, in each element in the database. Um, you can co-locate child rows and child tables with those customers. So suppose you have a foreign key relationship between your customer table and your order table, right? Customers place orders, orders are placed by customers. Um, you can tell us to put all of the orders in the system in the order table on the same set of elements as the um, customer that they're associated with. So if you're doing joins between the customers and the orders very quickly, as you often would, that data is co-located in the same place so you get the best performance. And finally, you can specify that you'd like to have some tables duplicated, so the entire table is on every element. And if, every time you update that element, we will update it atomically everywhere. Um, that's very useful for small read-only tables that you're going to use a lot, pricing tables and tax tables and things like that that, that almost all of your queries are going are to include. And, and you can mix all of, of course, you mix all of these together simultaneously in your app, in your data model. We provide high availability by taking those elements and grouping them into what we call replica sets. So in a system where we're um, keeping two copies of data, we will have two elements on two different machines, and we will make sure that those two elements are 100% identical at all times, um, at all times. Uh, so if one of these, and we could do another hour talking about this and high availability, but if this one goes down, when it comes back up, it'll resync from its, from its buddy, right? If this one bursts into flames and is never coming back, that's okay. You wheel another machine in, and we, you know, re and we, and we synchronize it from the one that survives, right? That's basically how high availability works in this environment. And we use two-phase commit protocols to keep both these in, oh, wrong button. We use two-phase proto commit protocols, highly optimized, um, to keep these two in sync, but also to provide transactional um, consistency among all the replica sets in your database. Um, as I said, you can add and remove capability from the, from the database. So if we need, we need to add more capacity, we just bring up two machines um, and we can copy some, we can move some subset of the data from the existing elements over to the, to the new ones and everything just keeps running. One of the things I'm very proud of, because frankly it's the part of the system that I've worked on for a lot of years now, is um, centralized installation and management. Um, you can, if you're setting up a 32 node cluster um, and, and deploying a database across it, you can do everything from one machine. You, you download the software, untar it on one machine. You don't have to go to the other 32 machines and even untar the software. We can push the software out from one place. We can create the database from one place. You can do backups from that place. You can expand and contract the system from that place. You can do monitoring and management. You never have to log on to any of those machines except one, ever. Okay, um, we're doing pretty well on time, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about performance. I talked about performance for times 10 classic, right? Microsecond response time. And again, remember I said in times 10 classic, response time is the key. There are a lot of ways to get improved throughput, but, but response time, if you want the fastest response time in the world, you need to use times 10 classic. Your application and the data are on the same machine. There's no round trips, no messaging, no network protocols, no network hops. That's how you get the fastest response time. Inherently in a scale out environment, there's some network traffic, right? 
And so response time is excellent here, but it's a little different. The, 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 goal, the emphasis in scale-out is about throughput, response, whereas the emphasis in classic is about response time. They're both good at both, um, but it depends on what you want. Uh, you get different things. So for scale-out, we've been, one, one benchmark we've been focusing on is a, um, is, is, a, is a fairly commonly used benchmark called YCSB, the Yahoo, I don't even know what it stands for, YCSB benchmark. In, a, in, a, in an environment with 95, in, to, to simplify it, there's a workload B in that at benchmark, 95% read, 5% write. And a lot of vendors of scale-out, modern, cool, sexy databases publish performance numbers for this benchmark. And so we went around a month or two ago, and for a number of different databases like this, we scoured the internet and we found the fastest YCSB benchmark B number in this configuration that we could find. And there they are. So for example, uh, not to pick on anybody, VoltDB on six nodes did one and a half million YCSB workload B transactions per second. So, so that's kind of how you read this table, right? So, and they're sorted just because I wanted to do it that way. They're sorted by the size of the cluster. If if your database scales and the biggest, if your database scales out real well, but the all you, you can only publish a number with it on two or three nodes, I, I don't. I guess your database doesn't really scale very well, but okay. So, so that's what the comp competition publishes. Maybe they have better numbers that they haven't published. Seems unlikely. So let's see what our numbers are. Well, let's start at the small end with a small cluster. Um, with two nodes running the exact same benchmark um, where the competition got a million or less transactions per second, we did 2.7, apples to apples comparison. Where, uh, so that's pretty good. Um, at four, these guys did half a million, we did five million. That's pretty good. Um, these, for these guys, they publish numbers in the six to nine range, one and a half million to half a million. We did 10 million and eight. That's pretty good. And at the, at the high end, Cassandra, you know, everybody always says Cassandra scales really well. That's true, Cassandra scales really well. They, they can publish a 30 machine number. It's kind of a low number. I guess it's easy to scale if you only do one transaction per second. Um, and they're better than that, but they did half a million, we did 38 million in about the same amount of hardware. So um, take that for whatever it's worth, right? Every artificial benchmark is an artificial benchmark. Your results will vary, but apples to apples, public numbers, there you go. And if, if, any vendor, if anybody from one of these vendors is here and you've got better numbers, put them on your website, and I'd love to change this slide. Um, that's pretty good. I think we've probably handled it. So Timestamp Scale-Out, right? Timestamp Classic, been around for 20 years, runs, runs the world in a lot of ways that you don't see every day, um, provides the fastest response time of any database, period. Period. Um, Timestamp Scale-Out takes that technology, expands it into a modern, scaled-out, horizontally scaled world. Um, and provides amazing throughput. Um, uh, so, you know, I guess the messages are, if anybody told you you have to abandon SQL in order to get performance, they're wrong. Um, you don't, right? Do you have to rewrite the world in order to take advantage of in-memory technology? Nope. Um, and um, that's, kind of, that's kind of where we are. Um, so, we do have a couple of minutes. I guess let me take a couple of questions, and we'll uh, we can f finish up in the hall. Yes, sir. We, thank you. <laughs> scale scale out version. Thank you. Um, the um, right. The question was the question was can you use times ten scale out along with the sharded edition of Oracle. And um, yes, you can. The one thing I need to say in the, it just in full disclosure, in the, the first, the current product, the current version of Times 10 scale out is the first version. 
um, that we've shipped. Um, and we have not yet enabled the caching capabilities that Times 10 Classic has in the scale out version of the product. I think you know, we have to get the core thing working and then, and then hook it up. And so in this release, there, you can certainly use the two together and we have ways to load data from Oracle into a Times 10 scale out database. But sort of the, some of the automatic stuff isn't quite there yet. But the answer is, is yeah, you can certainly do that. Let me answer that question a little more generically since I don't want to talk about products that we haven't announced yet. Remember, I said everything I say is a lie, remember. Um, the, in general, the right thing to do with Times 10 is not to locate it on the same machines as your database, right? The whole point, if you, if you think about that three-tier model where there's a database in the database tier and there's a bunch of applications in the middle tier and nobody really knows what the third tier is, Right? That's the model for 20 or 25 years for how you're supposed to design systems. It's the worst case model for performance because every time your app needs data, it's going to make a network hop back and forth, back to that database tier. Um, and that's nuts, right? But networks are expensive. Memory's fast, networks are slow. You want to put your in-memory data in the middle tier on those app servers so that you can access them, that in-memory data, without touching your network as much as you can. Now, in a scale-out world, you can't do that for everything. You're going to have to go over the network to get some of your data. But for the, for the fraction of data that happened, if, if, if my application is um, accessing my customer record and my customer record happens to be co-located on that same hardware, you don't want to go around, the tr you don't want to do any network hops at all. So in general, in-memory solutions belong in that middle tier, not back in the database tier. You want to eliminate network traffic as much as you can. I'm going to take one more question, and then I think we're out of time. You, you had one earlier. Uh, I was just wondering how, how compatible is it with, with, the, with the concept of uh, VMs? I mean, Works fine. Uh, the question was, do we work in VMs? And sure. So any of those nodes, which you can automatically go, sure. uh, that could be a, a VM also? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so physical hardware, VMs, we don't care. You know, they're, the, the virtual machine vendor's job is to make uh, virtual machines indistinguishable from real machines, and if we can tell the difference, they have a bug. Now, naturally, performance is going to vary. And, but, but honestly, the performance where VMs suck is network I.O. is slower than normal, right? Because you know, they do all the virtualization of network I.O. So, so VMs slow down networks. That's great for us, because I just said you want to arrange your in-memory data so that you don't use the network, okay. right? So, um, yeah, it works fine. I, I, think that's every, I think that's all the time we've got. So um, I hope this has at least intrigued you. Um, if you have more technical questions, um, I'll, be happy, I'll be out in the hall and come and see us over in the demo room and get your robot, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll hook you up. Thank you very much for coming.